Hello and welcome to this segment of the learning series of understanding and treating anxiety from an integrative perspective. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the Health Lord sits, the Akawal people of the Bundjalung Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. A little bit about me. This is me in my natural habitat. My name is Melanie Dearlove. I graduated as an osteopath from the University of Western Sydney and have been treating for the past 17 years. I started my osteopathic practice in the northern suburbs of Sydney for my first 15 years. I graduated as a Sutherland craniosacral osteopath in 2008, a GEMT dry needling practitioner in 2011, and a photobiomodulation practitioner in 2021. I'm currently completing a postgraduate diploma in traditional osteopathic philosophy and paediatrics. I joined the Health Lodge nearly two years ago after relocating from Sydney, and I'm so grateful to be a part of this amazing integrated medical team in Byron Bay. I've learnt so much about how I, as a manual therapist, can assist in complex cases with my colleagues in the medical, psychological, naturopathic, and alternative medicine realms together as a team. So what does an osteopath do? Osteopathy is a manual medicine that treats holistically, including all elements of the human body to reduce pain, disease, and dysfunction. Osteopaths provide musculoskeletal and nervous system orthopedic assessments, manual therapy, which includes soft tissue techniques, trigger point therapy, articulation or mobilization of the vertebrae in the joints and high velocity, low amplitude techniques or manipulation to the joints of the body. We also offer craniosacral and functional techniques like balancing tension of ligaments and counter strain techniques. We offer clinical exercise programs, movement, postural positioning advice and ergonomic assessments. We may also offer therapeutic needling techniques like dry needling or acupuncture through postgraduate training and also my new love, photobiomodulation. Osteopaths also offer ongoing support and educational advice about your lifestyle, stress and anxiety management, diet or other factors that may influence your pain, injury or movement. So how did osteopathy become? Osteopathy was founded by Dr. Andrew Taylor Still during the mid 1800s in the Midwest of America. Still, a medical physician at the time, considered health practices of the day to be harmful and ineffective in treating disease. And after the devastation of losing his family members to meningitis, he devoted 30 years to try to find an alternative method to orthodox medicine. His solution was simple. It was based upon the belief that if the body's structure is completely aligned and functioning normally, along with good blood and nerve supply, the body's ability to heal itself will be restored. His focus was aimed at treating the body holistically, addressing the underlying cause, as well as treating the symptoms. In 1953, the Kirksville College of Osteopathy and Surgery published the Osteopathic Tenants in the Journal of Osteopathy. These tenants are still used today, and I use them in my clinic every day. The body is a unit of mind, body, and spirit. The body possesses self-regulatory mechanisms. The structure and function of the body are reciprocally interrelated, and therefore rational therapy is based upon the understanding of the above three tenants. One other concept is that of the rule of the artery. Dr. Still stated that if the body's fluids are unhindered and free-flowing, being that of blood, lymph, nerve, cerebrospinal and ground substance, the body will be without pain, disease and dysfunction. So now we travel through history a little bit further and we come to this man, Dr. William Garner Sutherland. Dr. Sutherland discovered, developed and taught cranial osteopathy in the early to mid 1900s. Dr. Sutherland referred to his discovery as osteopathy in the cranial field. He never failed to emphasize that the cranial concept was only an extension of, not separate from, Dr. Steele's science of osteopathy. 
Dr. Sutherland was the first to perceive a subtle palpable movement within the bones of the cranium. He went on to discover the continuity of a rhythmic fluid movement throughout all tissues of the body. So while a student at the American School of Osteopathy in 1899, Dr. Sutherland pondered the fine details of a disarticulated skull, which is on this slide. He wondered about the function of this complex architecture. Dr. Still had taught that every structure exists because it performs a particular function. So while looking at a temporal bone, a flash of inspiration struck Dr. Sutherland. It's beveled like the gills of a fish, indicating a respiratory motion for an articular mechanism. He noted that the sutures of the skull were beveled for movement like a hinge instead of previous beliefs that the sutures of the skull are fused. He named his discovery the primary respiratory mechanism and recognised this phenomenon as life's purest and most vital expression, the life force. I truly believe his cranial concept may become regarded as one of the most important discoveries in human physiology. The primary respiratory mechanism has five components to this model. Firstly, you have motility of the brain and the spinal cord. There is fluctuation of the cerebrospinal fluid. There is mobility of intracranial and interspinal membranes and articular mobility of the cranial bones and an involuntary motion of the sacrum between the ilia. So here's an example of craniosacral motion or the reciprocal tension membrane. As you can see, the skull is going into its flexion phase and now coming back into its extension phase. There's usually about 13 what we call breaths per minute in, these, in this motion. Taking another look, we can see the whole reciprocal tension membrane here from sacrum to skull and we're going into flexion here and we're going back into extension. The hands of a craniosacral osteopath interact interact directly with the primary respiratory mechanism to bring about a therapeutic response of self-regulation. The osteopath is only a fulcrum for this regulation. The body regulates itself. So in terms of treatment of anxiety, the osteopath can engage the patient's craniosacral movement, act as a fulcrum, and the body then self-regulates its own autonomic nervous system. So we've gone into anxiety at a much deeper level in previous um, segments. I'm just going to now do an, a recap on anxiety. So anxiety is an excessive and uncontrollable anticipation of future perceived threats. Feeling anxious in certain situations can help us avoid danger, triggering our fight or flight response. This is how we have evolved to keep ourselves safe. However, when your worries don't go away, happen for no particular reason, are out of proportion to the situation or get in the way of your daily life, this may indicate that you have an anxiety disorder. Anxiety can present as feeling on edge or unable to stop worrying, restlessness or irritability, shortness of breath or breathing rapidly, difficulty concentrating, sleep disturbance, fatigue and exhaustion, feeling lightheaded, faint or dizzy, avoiding situations which make you feel anxious and many physical reactions to the body, which I'll go through later today. So here we have the polyvagal theory. And in previous segments, we've gone into this in much detail. So I'm just gonna do a recap. The polyvagal theory is a collection of evolutionary neuroscientific and psychological constructs pertaining to the role of the vagus nerve in emotional regulation, social connection and fear response. We at the Health Lodge use this theory to assess where the patient is in themselves during assessment, diagnosis and treatment. So here we see we have the three states. We have at the bottom your ventral vagal. This is where we have social engagement, we are grounded and we are safe. However, if arousal increases, we may find ourselves in either of the two of the above. Firstly, the dorsal vagal. This is where we, we freeze, our body collapses, we are numb, we dis disassociate. Or you can find yourself in the sympathetic. This is where your fight or flight response comes in, where we have panic, maybe anger, and where anxiety lies. 
The sympathetic state, as I just said, is where the patient presenting with anxiety would lie and their signs and symptoms, whether it be mental, emotional and physical. And so I'm going to be concentrating on the physical signs and symptoms today. So here are some of the physical responses to the sympathetic state. You may have poor posture, you may have bodily shaking, which may be visible in the extremities. You may get headaches, sleep disturbances and insomnia, TMJ dysfunction, which is clenching, grinding and muscle hypertonicity, overactivation of the accessory respiratory musculature and also cervical rectus spinae. It may affect your heart rate variability or it may increase your heart rate. You may get changes to the mobility and the motility of the reciprocal tension membrane and therefore craniosacral motion. You may have hypertonicity and reduced function in the respiratory diaphragm and psoas musculature. And you may have gastrointestinal functional changes through the, the vagus nerve. And just a recap of the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. It is the vagabond nerve, the longest cranial nerve. It has both sensory and motor functions. And the sensory functions are divided into two components. The somatic components, these are the sensations felt on the skin or in the muscles. All the visceral components, these are the sensations felt in the organs of the body. The sensory functions of the vagus nerve include providing somatic sensation information for the skin, behind the ear, the external part of the ear canal, and certain parts of the throat. Supplying visceral sensations, information for the larynx, esophagus, lungs, trachea, heart, and most of the digestive tract. And it also plays a small role in the sensation of taste near the root of the tongue. The motor functions of the vagus nerve include stimulating muscles in the pharynx, larynx, and soft palate, stimulating muscles in the heart, where it helps to lower resting heart weight, and stimulating involuntary contractions of the digestive tract, including the esophagus, stomach, and most of the intestines. Osteopaths can access and create change to the vagus nerve throughout the whole body. Osteopathic treatment can help balance the autonomic nervous system by a gentle manipulation of the vagus nerve. Osteopathic manipulative technique, technique releases soft tissue and joint restrictions in the cranial base and the upper neck to alleviate any compression on the vagus nerve so it can function normally and facilitate good digestion via the gut-brain axis and affect heart rate variability. So this is the aim of osteopathic therapeutic intervention for anxiety. We need overall management of effective bodily fluid flow, nervous system regulation, heart rate variability, reduced muscular hypertonicity, fascial and ligamentous tension, improved body biomechanics to support a healthy posture, reduce headaches, increase respiratory efficacy, and regulate craniosacral motion. I am now going to be demonstrating through the next slides examples of osteopathic techniques I use in my practice to help patients with anxiety. So firstly, we have the neck and the anterior triangle region. So I like to use soft tissue techniques, long axis kneading or inhibition to the cervical musculature, you can also do the same to the accessory respiratory musculature and also use suboccipital inhibition to release the suboccipital muscles and also OAD compression, which you can see here. Examples of anxiety related treatments include a specific focus on the suboccipital region, which are associated with increased heart rate variability, improved autonomic homeostasis, decreased muscular tension and reduced perception of stress. And as you saw before, you can also use cervical spine, high velocity, low amplitude techniques when warranted. And now moving on to the thoracic region. I always release the transverse fascia of the thoracic diaphragm first. This can take a lot of time, but I have to just be patient. Also, as you can see here, we can use rib raising techniques concentrating on the areas from T1 to T6, which is the sympathetic innervation to the heart and lung region.
I can also do the same technique bilaterally right up near the CT junction. It also helps blood flow and breathing efficacy. And you can also use accessory respiratory muscle, soft tissue, uh, thoracic erector spinae, soft, soft tissue techniques. And as saying before, this also frees up uh, any, any tightness through the area, increasing blood flow, and also relaxing the patient as who doesn't like soft tissue. Here yeah, I use a high velocity, low amplitude technique for the upper ribs to help give more movement, especially when the patient is a chest breather. Usually we find these in the anxious patient. And I can also use an upper thoracic uh, HVLA technique to the thoracic segments of those ribs. Here we can just see an example of a high velocity low amplitude technique to the upper thoracics. Moving on to the respiratory diaphragm, I always um, release the transverse fascia of the respiratory diaphragm. It can take some time. I can also do some cervical mobilization or high velocity or low amplitude to the upper cervicals, especially uh, C3 to 5, which is the phrenic nerve motor innervation of the diaphragm. Here I'm using some rib raising techniques uh, and articulation of the lower six costal ribs, which is the, or the origin of the diaphragm. Uh, I can also use lower thoracic uh, mobilization and HVLA. Here, I am actually doing a technique where we re-dome that diaphragm, just waking it up so it can actually really have full function in inspiration and expiration. And I can also do a direct inhibition to the diaphragm muscle itself. So moving on to the gut, I tend to use visceral manipulation directly to the stomach a visceral manipulation uh, improves the motion, the in, it influences the ligaments that attach to the stomach, the small and large intestines, and also improves blood flow and fluid flow. I can also use thoracic vertebra articulation, mobilization to um, the areas of T5 to 9, which is a sympathetic uh, innovation to those upper gastrointestinal organs. I can also use rib raising all the way through the thoracics into the upper lumbars. And here I'm using a functional technique that that's directly for the celiac ganglia and the superior and inferior mesenteric ganglia, directly affecting the vagus nerve. And now down to the sacrum. I tend to always use uh, craniosacral release techniques that balance the reciprocal tension membrane from the sacrum. However, you can also use sacral decompression and sacral rocking articulation and mobilization techniques. You can also use a lumbosacral high velocity technique to also achieve the same results. Here, I'm uh, just releasing the transverse fascia of the pelvic diaphragm, which can take some time. And you can also do direct inhibition of the iliacus and the psoas musculature. But it's always good to have a general look at the pelvic mechanics and also the pelvic floor. As you can see, getting into the psoas right there. Here we are moving on to the TMJ. With anxiety, we see patients presenting with teeth clenching and grinding and also really, really tight musculature, especially the masseter muscles. So I always uh, try to relieve the hypotonic musculature with these internal techniques. You can do a direct inhibition of the masseters, the temporalis, 
and also the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. This also helps to release any strain pattern that is going on at the sphenoid or the mandible bones. So here's some craniosacral techniques that I use in my clinic for my patients. Firstly, you can use um, a techniques to balance the cranial base, which is the occiput and sphenoid. You can also use techniques to balance the vault, which is the frontals, the parietals and the temporals. You can also balance any individual bones in the skull uh, to reduce any strain patterns that may be going on in the skull. And you can also use techniques for the maxillae and the mandible, which I'm doing right here. Lastly, there is a CV4 technique, which we use, and it's for compression of the fourth ventricle. This is to help produce and transport cerebrospinal fluid throughout the brain and into the spinal cord. Compression of the fourth ventricle influences autonomic nervous system function and has been shown to alter physiological parameters of blood flow velocity, heart rate, blood pressure, and cerebral tissue oxygenation. And here brings us to photobiomodulation. Photobiomodulation, also known as low level laser therapy, uses LED and infrared light to boost the body's natural ability in response to pain, inflammation, swelling, and muscular spasm, whilst increasing energy and oxygen levels through the mitochondria in the cells. Photobiomodulation can reduce inflammation in the brain, spinal cord, muscles, ligaments, abdominal viscera, and assist in wound healing. So what can you do at home to help with your anxiety? There are a few things that we can do. Firstly, there's cold pack or cold water therapy. And these provide nervous system regulation, releases inflammation and stimulates the vagus nerve. Basically, you can jump into a cold shower, jump into an ice cold bath, or simply grab an ice pack from the freezer, wrap it in a tea towel and pop it on your chest and leave it there for a few minutes and you'll feel your nervous system regulate. Next, you can do some gentle neck stretching using your cervical ocular reflex. This releases muscle and muscle and muscle and fascial restrictions and stimulates the vagus nerve. So simply what you can do is you can come and take your arm over the top, stretching the neck to the side, and then what you do is you look up, diagonally opposite and up, and hold for 30 seconds. Release and repeat to the other side. And lastly, we've got the diaphragmatic and box breathing. So diaphragmatic breathing uh, increases, obviously, breathing efficacy, increases oxygen absorption, and regulates the nervous system. To make sure that you are using the diaphragm in breathing, what you should do is pop your, ha pop your hands just on the, your upper abdomen. And when breathing, you should be feeling your belly being breathing into your hands. If not, you might actually be chest breathing. So it's best to practice pushing that stomach out into your hands while you're breathing. And with box breathing, it's an easy way to calm down the nervous system. Basically, what you're doing is taking four counts to box in, breathe in, four counts, hold for four counts, breathe out for four counts, and hold for four counts. And you just do that over for maybe 30 seconds to a minute, and you'll feel your, your nervous system start to regulate and calm down. So I'm so glad that you're all now relaxed, and I wanna thank you for listening to my presentation.